Good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for time, taking the time to join us today. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network. Our webinar today is hosted by the Family Development Concentration Area of the Military Families Learning Network. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of the Zoom webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides that we're sharing. If you're unable to see them or have any other technical difficulties today, please send us a tech support request via email at milfamellen at gmail.com. As some of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod for conversation and thoughtful questions today. To embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides that you, you should see on your screen. You'll then be able to see a toolbar pop up across the bottom. And then from there, you can just click the chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, please be sure to send them to the all panelists and attendees response option so everyone is able to view them in the chat pod and better facilitate a, a thoughtful and robust conversation today. We'll also be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families, and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research into one another through innovative online programming. I'll now turn, th turn things over to my colleague, Kaylin Goebel, who is the program coordinator with the MFLN Family Development Team to introduce our presenter today. Kaylin. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Coral. Um, we're glad that everyone could join us today. Before we begin today's session, um, if you have not done so already, please make sure to visit the webinar event page for materials on today's session, including a handout copy of this PowerPoint presentation, um, which will be near the bottom of the page under event materials. Throughout this webinar, our FD team member, Jason Jowers, will also be providing resources for you in the chat pod, so be sure to watch out for those um, in the chat. As you can see, he's already been doing. So we are very excited to welcome and be joined by today's presenter, Dr. Elizabeth Laterno. A little bit about Dr. Laterno. She is a professor with the Department of Mental Health and director of the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse at John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her career has focused on developing and evaluating child sexual abuse prevention policy and practice. She is actually currently leading an evaluation of federal policy impacts on violence prevention and a large scale project to develop more effective methods for communicating about child sexual abuse as a preventable public health problem. Her work was very recently spotlighted at the United Nations in Geneva, where she actually participated in a panel on preventing sexual abuse of children. We are very excited to have her join us today, fresh off that trip, to continue speaking on this important topic. So at this time, um, I have the pleasure of turning things over to Dr. Letourneau. Um, thank you. It is a real pleasure to be here. And I just do want to make sure uh, if somebody can let me know that that everything is working with my mic. You're sounding great. Perfect, great. Um, it is a real pleasure to get to speak to this audience. And before I get started, I wanna just spend a moment um, talking about how we talk about um, child sexual abuse and youth problems, sexual behaviors and related topics. Um, I understand that um, military family advocacy programs and, and uh, folks who, who who arrange these kinds of trainings have done a really remarkable job of uh, being very thoughtful about how we talk about uh, children with problem sexual behaviors, including children who have engaged in illegal sexual behaviors. When I talk about children, I mean anyone under the age of 18, which aligns with the UN Convention of the, on the Rights of the Child, uh, a convention that is actually turning 30 uh, this month, 30 years old, uh, 30 years ago. Um, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child was was released, and um, that's in part one of the reasons why I was in Geneva last week speaking was in honor of that celebration. Um, so I was really delighted to learn that the military takes um, how it talks about these issues very seriously. I may speak uh, sometimes a little bit differently uh, or use different language um, than, uh, than, than exactly aligns. Um, with the language that you all are used to, but generally speaking, I avoid any kind of labeling of children. I uh, certainly never call them juvenile sex offenders or sex offenders are certainly not predators. Um, and research actually shows us that those labels are harmful. A study by a colleague of mine, Andy Harris and Kelly Sosia, two colleagues of mine, showed that when um, 
adults read descriptions of kids who engage in harmful sexual behavior. And those descriptions include labels like juvenile sex offenders. Adults are more likely to, to support punitive responses and to not support treatment or prevention responses. So language really matters. And um, uh, calling kids juveniles even, or calling them juvenile sex offenders is harmful to them. So um, hopefully that is one thing that you will, that you will notice uh, as we go throughout this training. Um, all right, I'm gonna start with, oops, sorry. I'm gonna start with uh, describing a case that, that I've been involved with for now many years, the case of Bobby. Bobby's childhood was tragic. He was raised by substance abusing parents who uh, never married. His mother took custody, but then lost it due to neglect when Bobby was just 14 months old. Bobby's father had served time for murder and was actively alcoholic, and yet he was still the better choice for raising Bobby. Um, Bobby's father subjected Bobby to harsh physical punishment and emotional abuse from a very early age. Uh, he showed clear preferential treatment um, to his step-grandchildren. Uh, I'll give you just one heart-wrenching heart example. Um, uh, the woman that, that Bobby's father married who then co-raised Bobby, her grandchildren would spend a quite a bit of time in their home. And one time Bobby's dad came home with three soapbox derby cars for the kids to own and drive around. And they were for the three grandchildren, step-grandchildren. Uh, they were not for Bobby. Um, worse still, Bobby was severely physically assaulted by his mother's husband. So his mother married, um, Bobby would spend time with his mother and her her husband over the summers. And between the ages of five and eight years of age, um, when Bobby would visit his mother, her husband would just uh, severely beat him um, to the point where he defecated um, and once kidnapped Bobby and his mother, raped her and beat Bobby, exposed Bobby to pornography. Again, this was between the ages of five and eight while making Bobby drink alcohol. And there's um, circumstantial but strong evidence that this man also uh, anally raped Bobby. Among this tragedy, there were a few bright spots. Um, against all odds, Bobby was born at full term. He met typical developmental milestones and he achieved good grades uh, in, in grade school. His father maintained regular employment despite having an alcohol problem. And Bobby's stepmother was a stable, if relatively unloving presence in Bobby's life. Children, of course, require the presence of loving adults in their lives there to thrive, and so Bobby did not thrive. Having no good models for emotional regulation, Bobby failed to learn to regulate his own emotions. Having too many models of verbal and physical aggression, he became verbally and physically aggressive. And having been sexually victimized, he learned to use sex as a weapon. At the age of 10, Bobby initiated inappropriate and harmful sexual behavior with his stepmother's youngest grandchild, a six-year-old boy to whom Bobby's father had demonstrated, demonstrated love and tenderness. It baffled Bobby watching his father, who had never shown anything but disdain for Bobby, behave so differently, so nicely with this younger boy. And it made Bobby wanna hurt this boy to punish him for usurping paternal affection that was by rights Bobby's. Now the six-year-old boy was medically fragile and his older siblings were punished severely when they treated him too roughly. So instead of hitting the younger boy, Bobby sexually abused him and he made the boy give him oral sex. Bobby was 10. He could not possibly have understood the consequences of this behavior apart from having some notion based on his own victimization, that this would hurt the boy. Bobby kept this up for about three years and the younger boy stayed silent. Meanwhile, Bobby's behavior deteriorated at school and at home. After getting into a fight with a classmate, Bobby picked up his first juvenile offense for disturbing schools and was placed on probation. This was when he was 11. And he began lashing out at his father and his stepmother. As a result of one particularly violent incident, <coughs> excuse me, Bobby was placed in psychiatric care and then in a residential treatment facility 
to address his aggressive behavior. While at this residential treatment facility, Bobby's roommate, a 14-year-old boy, tried to anally rape Bobby. And when Bobby went home on a weekend pass, he anally raped his younger relative. After the second rape, the younger boy finally broke his silence and told his mother, who told her mother, who was Bobby's stepmother. When confronted by his stepmother, Bobby confessed his behaviors, and he wrote a letter to his stepmother saying he knew that his actions were wrong, and that he was glad it was over, that he hoped his younger relative would be okay. No one in this story is okay. Bobby's father and stepmother drove him to the police station that day, showed them Bobby's letter. He was arrested. The prosecutor assigned to the case used that letter to convict Bobby of the harshest charge possible, criminal sexual conduct with a minor in the first degree. And the judge sentenced Bobby to the longest prison term possible, five years. Bobby was 13 years old when he arrived and 18 years old when his prison sentence ended. In the intervening years, Bobby reinvented himself. Away from his abusive family, Bobby learned something about self-control. His brain continued to mature as young brains will, and he developed his capacities for empathy, for understanding, for delay of gratification. The prison social worker attested to Bobby's improved behavior. A review of records showed declining disciplinary infractions as each year progressed. And specialized risk assessment, penile plethysmography, even documented that Bobby was attracted to young women and not to the little boys. Prison is no place to raise a child. But prison is where Bobby found himself, and he ultimately made the best of it, completing sex offender therapy, earning his GED, and picking up some vocational skills. When it was time for release, Bobby was prepared as best he could for the outside world. But he did not return to the outside world. Bobby was not released from incarceration after spending five formative years in prison. The state where Bobby resided is one of 20 states and the federal government that operate sex offender civil commitment facilities. These facilities are designed to indefinitely hold and treat adult sex offenders who are deemed too dangerous to release back into the community after serving their time in prison. This is called preventive detention. Sex offender civil commitment was designed for men like Earl Schreiner. As a teen, Mr. Schreiner killed a classmate and attempt to kill another child. As a young man, he raped at least four teenage girls, probably more. He was finally sentenced to a 10-year prison term. While incarcerated, Mr. Schreiner made plans to abuse, rape, mutilate, and kill more children if he was ever released from prison. He was released and he made good on that promise with the sexual mutilation of a young boy whom he left for dead in the woods. Sex offender civil commitment was never intended for minors, for people who committed their sexual offenses before the 18th age of 18, and certainly not for people who committed their offenses at the ages of 10, 11, or 12. And yet Bobby's state decided, against all credible evidence, that he presented a threat similar to that of Mr. Schreiner. And the state fought to put him away in a high security sex offender civil commitment facility, a facility whose own director went on, to re on record to say that Bobby did not belong there, that Bobby was too young for that facility and would be endangered by the more truly dangerous men already housed there. These pleas fell on deaf ears and Bobby State committed him. The civil commitment director supported Bobby's almost annual efforts to secure release. Every 12 to 18 months, Bobby's lawyers would petition the courts for release. Every time they did, the state would petition against release and a jury trial would ensue. Jurists never deigned to release Bobby from civil commitment. Finally, Bobby's lawyers won his release through a state Supreme Court challenge. He was 22 years old. I've spoken with Bobby several times since then. He's registered as a violent, sexually violent predator in the state where he now resides, and he will be registered as such for the rest of his life. What this means is that every three months he has to present himself in person to the sheriff's office have his picture taken and posted on a public offender registry, along with his home address and other information. 
He's found it difficult to maintain employment and he has work only through family connections. He's not permitted to travel without registering in each new place that he visits. There are hundreds of scientific publications demonstrating that incarcerating children does little to improve community safety and indeed can increase a child's risk for committing new offenses. There are dozens of scientific publications, many of them my own, demonstrating that subjecting children to registration and to public notification does nothing to improve community safety. Our research links juvenile sex offender registration with increased risk for the worst possible outcomes for children. Compared to non-registered children who had committed sex offenses, registered children were four times more likely to report having attempted suicide in the past 30 days. They were five times more likely to report having been approached by an adult for sex in the past year. And they were twice as likely to report having been the victim of a contact sexual assault victimization in the past year. So I just wanna take a second and emphasize this last point. Juvenile sex offender registration and notification is a federally required policy that's actually associated with the very type of harm that it intends to prevent. I am aware that some people think that's fine, that some people believe that anyone who sexually abuses a child deserves a decade or more of confinement, a lifetime of public shaming on the registry, that some people don't care that these interventions fail to improve community safety so long as they punish sex offenders. But I wonder how this makes any sense for a child, for any child, but especially a child whose behavior was so clearly tied to his own victimization. Does a child become a perpetrator and that's that, no matter his age or experience? And again, I'm aware that for some people, it still does make sense that regardless of age or experience, these people, these sex offenders get what they deserve. And in that case, I would ask, what about the victim? Nothing that happened to Bobby helped his victim. Nothing about waiting for harm to occur before intervening helps any victim. Based on public records, Bobby's year of residential treatment cost approximately $90,000. His five years in youth prison cost $250,000. And his five years in sex offender civil commitment cost $315,000. Then there's the costs associated with his initial, initial prosecution for his school offense, prosecutions from his sexual offenses, several jury trials, the state Supreme Court trial, and lifetime sex offender registration and notification, collectively and very, very conservatively. The state invested more than $700,000 in Bobby. And I would argue that none of that money made one bit of difference to Bobby's victim. So how much did the state invest in prevention efforts? In Bobby's records, to which I had access as an expert witness for one of his trials, I found little evidence that he or his parents were ever provided with effective prevention or treatment programming. Several programs work to prevent young first-time parents like Bobby's from abusing or neglecting their children. You will all be familiar with these programs. Programs such as nurse or other um, home visiting family partnership type programs in which trained individuals regularly visit expectant parents and provide education and support to the parents through a child's sec second birthday. Likewise, several early intervention programs effectively prevent or address a child's disruptive behaviors, programs such as the incredible years, in which interventionists meet with small groups of parents and children up to the age of 12 to provide skills training, practice role plays, and other interventions designed to improve parenting practices and to effectively address child behavior problems. And there are well-validated treatment programs that effectively address a teenager's serious delinquent behaviors, including harmful sexual behaviors, such as multi-systemic therapy for problem sexual behavior and cognitive behavior therapy for problem sexual behavior. These are interventions that work closely with parents and children to identify the risk factors for engaging in harmful behaviors and to effectively address those. 
both of these programs, Multisystemic Therapy for Problem Sexual Behavior and Jane Solovsky's um, Problem Sexual Behavior Cognitive Behavior Therapy, are clinically and cost effective. Had the state where Bobby was raised elected to provide these or similar prevention and early intervention programs to Bobby and his parents, the total bill would have amounted to less than $25,000. That's 28 times less than the state ultimately paid out. And Bobby might never have sexually assaulted his younger relative, or the abuse might have been discovered and addressed before it progressed to rape. Designating massive resources after sexual abuse has already occurred, and almost no resources to prevent abuse is a choice. Children are harmed by this choice. We are all harmed by this choice. So why do we do this? Why do we put nearly all of our money, time, and effort into detection and punishment? I believe that we focus so much energy on after-the-fact responses because most people don't really believe that child sexual abuse can be prevented. Instead, we believe that people who sexually abuse children are monsters, that they are the ultimate other, and the best we can do is to keep them out or lock them up, no matter what the cost. We believe that people who commit sex crimes are on an irreversible trajectory towards more offending and towards greater harm. We believe they are all Earl Shriners. And this simply is not true. It may surprise some of the people in this training that about half of sexual offenses committed against young prepubescent children are committed by children under the age of 18 and usually under the age of 15. This may seem surprising, but it makes sense if you consider that children who are just beginning to become sexual are vulnerable to making uh, mistakes and bad decisions. They don't understand consent. They don't know that their younger friends and family members are off limits. They don't know that sexual images of children are illegal. And we don't teach them. Hundreds of research studies including a meta-analysis based on tens of thousands of cases conducted by my friend and colleague, Michael Caldwell, 33,000 cases of juvenile sex crime uh, offenses, found that 97% of children convicted of a first sexual offense are never convicted of a second one. That's a less than a 3% sexual recidivism rate. Clearly, these children are not on an irreversible trajectory towards more or worse offending. Moreover, the fact that so few of children adjudicated for sex crimes ever reoffend with a new sex crime suggests that we probably could have prevented the first crime in the first place. This slide that's in front of you right now is adapted from uh, a table that's in the paper uh, that Mark Chaffin published a few years ago. We know, and you know, that children act out sexually for any number of reasons, including ignorance, impulsivity, and inadequate adult supervision, including exposure to harmful role models, exposure to developmentally inappropriate sexual stimuli, and sexual and, and physical assault victimization. Developing, evaluating, and disseminating effective strategies to prevent the onset of sexual offending should be a national priority on par with prosecuting and punishing children after they've already engaged in harmful behavior. To build a comprehensive approach to child sexual abuse, an approach that includes effective prevention efforts, requires resources. Elected officials tell me they agree it would be better to prevent child sexual abuse, that no child should have to experience sexual abuse. They understand that prevention is probably more cost effective than after the fact intervention, but they just don't have the money. Yet, they have $700,000 to invest in Bobby. Recently, my colleagues and I published an economic evaluation of child sexual abuse. We estimated that the annual economic burden of child sexual abuse to the United States 
is more than $9 billion. We have the money. We have the money to focus on and fund prevention efforts. We just choose to put it elsewhere. So it, we are just gonna pause a moment for any questions that we have. It looks like there haven't been any questions coming in so far. We did have um, a comment though during that portion talking about from Alan, talking about that investing in providing support for parents and family members at risk of abusing children like Dr. Letourneau just spoke to, um, to reduce the number of children at risk is a critical alternative approach. And um, Alan noted, where are the parenting classes in like high schools and freshman years in college to cover this, which is um, a great question. And Dr. Letourneau, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit in regards to where the best places are for providing to go to to look for those resources? Um, I, can, I can briefly mention that, you know, we know there are effective school-based prevention interventions. I'll mention some work that the Morris Center that I direct is, is doing that, are, that is, provides school-based interventions. The CDC does have some, some resources for parents um, uh, to try to uh, uh, address the sexual education of their children and reduce the likelihood that children uh, will engage in harmful sexual behavior. I believe they've got some parent-focused resources. Um, so if you go to the, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and um, you know, type in a few keywords, I think you'll see those. Um, there are you know, many, many, many um, places that, uh, tools that are out there that, that are attempting to be helpful. Um, Stop It Now is a, is a, on, uh, an organization that focuses on prevention. They've got resources on their website, and I believe some resources for parents. I'm not 100% sure, but I think so. So Stop It Now, all one word. Um, there's Stop It Now in the U.S. and in the U.K., and the U.K. even has uh, more resources. They have a little more funding. Um, and um, Darkness to Light is another prevention organization that has uh, adult focused uh, prevention training a 90 minute I think or maybe 60 60 or 90 minute online training to help help parents with some of these issues but I completely agree that that effective sex education would be one way to to start uh, working with um, children and their parents and educators uh, to provide um, accurate information that uh, helps them you know engage in in appropriate behavior and avoid inappropriate behavior. And like I said, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I describe some of our work. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your comments, Alan. We appreciate that. We'll have a few more um, stopping points throughout the presentation if you do have any questions that come up for Dr. Letourneau. Dr. Letourneau. Um, so before I get into the prevention interventions that we are developing and evaluating at my center, I'd like to spend just a little more time um, talking about where we do choose to put our money. And when I say our money, I mean all of us as taxpayers. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about, about these after the fact criminal justice interventions. Um, so uh, one thing that I, I find uh, quite striking is the amount of money that we put into incarceration. In the US, as you probably know, whoops, I'm so sorry, spends more uh, money on incarceration than any other country, although like, the United States, every other country um, spends more money on punishment than they do on prevention. So we are certainly not alone there. And in any given, in any given year, you know, the, the US locks up about 166,000 people in state facilities and about 16,000 people in federal uh, prisons who have committed sex crimes. So um, these are, these are the, the number of people who have committed sex crimes who are incarcerated. And it costs now actually about $35,000 per person per year, but we can, the, these numbers are a little bit old. Um, so that's what PPPY means per person per year. And so when you do the math, what you find is that we're spending um, right around $6 billion, $6 billion every year to incarcerate sex offenders, um, which is a lot of money. And when you look at how long we keep them incarcerated. We, we incarcerate people for sex crimes longer than we incarcerate people for any other kind of offense. Um, at the federal level, that even includes murder. The average sentence length for someone incarcerated for a sex crime exceeds the average sentence length for someone 
incarcerated for murder. At the state level, um, people incarcerated for murder spend more time in prison. Um, but, but what this means is that both annually in terms of all people convicted of sex crimes and then individually, an individual person of sex crime, we are putting a lot of money, we're investing a lot of money per person, like we did with Bobby, like that one state did with Bobby. Um, and I am not arguing that we do away with prison for adults, um, but we do need to be clear about how much we're spending on this and the fact that no other country locks people up for as long as we do, and yet they have the same rates of offending. So that suggests at least to me that we could look at our average sentence lengths and probably reduce them without increasing the risk of harm to children and other people. Six billion dollars is a lot of money. Um, another place, of course, where we put a lot of money is sex offender civil commitment, which you heard me talk about in Bobby's case. 20 states, DC and the federal government run sex offender civil commitment facilities. And these are facilities where we lock people up after they've served their prison sentences. They're locked up indefinitely. They're all high security facilities. Um, and they're legal, they're constitutional because they provide treatment. So the goal there is to uh, keep communities safe um, and provide treatment. So sex offender civil commitment is much more expensive per person per year than prison. Um, our numbers indicate that each of these facilities costs about $150,000 per person per year because you have not only uh, prison guards, you also have to have psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers. So you have expensive um, professionals who work at these facilities to treat the inmates. Um, Nobody gets out of a sex offender civil commitment facility in fewer than four years unless they sue their way out. And most people have stayed in these facilities since they were incarcerated in them. So people generally don't get released. Um, you may be aware of some federal class action lawsuits against a couple of sex offender civil, uh, civil commitment facilities that have never released a single individual since opening in the 1990s. Um, so again, what we see as a very, very, very high individual investment. So per, not just per person per year, but individually, when we send someone to these facilities, we're, we are going to invest as taxpayers anywhere from $400,000 at a minimum to many millions of dollars for a single individual. Um, and, you know, again, the Earl Shriners of the world, you know, Earl Shriners, one reason why we have sex offender civil commitment, um, there are very few Earl Shriners out there, and yet we've got about uh, more than 5,000 people in sex offender civil commitment facilities right now, and the number can literally only go up because so few people are ever released. Um, again, these facilities make sense for a minority of people, um, but we need to be aware that we are um, putting a lot of money into these efforts and probably casting too wide of a net for who should go in there. Uh, so when you know, when people on the Hill, when I hear a congressman tell me to my face that we don't have the money for prevention, it kind of makes me want to scream because there's no check we won't write when it comes to punishment. And we have got to start shifting our thinking around this. We've got to at least include prevention. Um, there's a couple of other costs that are uh, associated with uh, criminal justice interventions. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware that in some states, uh, people who are registered are restricted with respect to where they may live, where they may go to school, where they may be employed. Um, uh, this, of course, results in um, a lot of costs to registrants, uh, people who are registered sex offenders. Um, I realize that that is a group of people that doesn't uh, engender a lot of sympathy. But the fact of the matter is, is that when people cannot find and maintain safe housing, good employment, and find and maintain pro-social relationships, that just makes them less likely to be law-abiding citizens, not more likely. And you can imagine the effects of these kinds of restrictions on children. These restrictions are where you can go to school and where you can play. These are the places kids need to be, but registered children are prohibited from being in or near schools, playgrounds, um, and so on. Um, of course, there's registration notification. There is now just a 
a pile of data indicating that these are failed policies. These policies do not reduce recidivism. They do not reduce first time sex crimes. And they are extremely expensive for states, tribes, other jurisdictions, and the federal government to run. Um, so we're at another place for questions before I move into talking about our prevention intervention efforts. Yes, and um, I think that will tie in perfectly with what Alan actually continued. He um, had a comment regarding the how stranger danger is often much more pushed to the for the public, um, and then in regards to also the more of the stigma around acknowledging CSA um, coming from parents or close relatives or friends of the children. And Dr. Letourneau will be, of course, like she just noted, um, exploring the public health approach aspect to that violence prevention in a few moments. Yeah, and we all know, I'm sure everyone in this webinar knows that the people most likely to engage in harmful sexual behavior with children are people well known to the children. These are friends, acquaintances, family members, coaches, teachers. Um, people in the neighborhood, uh, uh, extended family members, um, uh, you know, as I already mentioned, children are, are, are at risk of making bad choices and, and mistakes when it comes to their early sexual behaviors. Um, typically, that's with friends and family members um, and other neighbors. And so all of these policies, registration, notification, very long incarceration period, sex offender civil commitment are predicated on a stranger who it is, you know, sort of the, the prototypical, unpredictable, unpreventable monster. And, you know, for those interventions, we or for those individuals, we certainly should be willing to put a lot of resources into them, but they, they are the, the extreme minority of people who cause sexual harm. So what does prevention look like? And, and with this particular um, audience, I, I think I probably don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I want to say that the single most common question I get is what would prevention look like? How do you prevent child sexual abuse? And I get that question from people who are well versed in prevention interventions for child physical abuse and neglect. So it's, so it's you know, it seems to be uh, hard to envision even for folks sort of steeped in prevention. And so what I like to do to make this more real, and perhaps this is a strategy you might use as well, is to step, take a step back and just look at some other public health prevention interventions that are well known to the public. So surgical gloves that are used by physicians and other healthcare providers, the infant um, safety car seat, and vaccines. In this case, it's a, a polio vaccine that you're, you're taking a look at that picture. So surgical gloves, uh, were actually invented at Johns Hopkins University. The baby car seat was not invented, but was perfected there. Likewise, polio vaccines were not invented, but were uh, maximized. Uh, the, the, the strategy for combining the chemicals to maximize the effectiveness of polio vaccines occurred at Johns Hopkins. So these are all public health interventions that have really been um, uh, promulgated by and supported by, by Hopkins, where I work. So that's why I like to use them as Examples, and they all seem easy and obvious today, right? Everybody uses car seats with their kids. Nobody would, would allow a physician to operate on them without wearing gloves. And, and the great majority of us recognize the promise of vaccines against the threat of disease. But all of these prevention interventions face significant pushback. Um, first of all, they all took significant resources to develop and perfect. Um, and indeed, we're, we continue to perfect them. Um, but they also all receive pushback. And I'll just give you a, a, a short story from my own life. Uh, so I'm one of five siblings. I'm the oldest. And my baby sister is 23 years younger than I am. Uh, so I was in grad school when Jenny came along. And by then, car seats were the law of the land. You, you couldn't take your baby out of a hospital without a car seat. But my mom and dad had raised four other kids without using car seats. And they hated these things. My mom especially absolutely believed that the car seat made Jenny fussier. And she'd be much better off if we just let her jump around in the minivan like all the rest of us had. Um, nobody believes that anyone anymore. Nobody acts like that. My sister Jenny just had her first baby um, two months ago. And you better believe she used a car seat and didn't think twice about it. I believe with the right resources, this is where we could be with the prevention of child sexual abuse in five or 10 years that we could actually be here where we have these easy and obvious strategies that we just kind of assume have always been there. 
So when we think about preventing violence in particular, there's a public health approach that focuses on four steps. First, you got to define the problem. What's the scope of the problem? Who's at risk? Then you have to identify risk and protective factors. What increases or decreases the risk of, of experiencing this type of violence? Then you develop and test. There's a strong emphasis in public health on evaluation. You develop and test prevention strategies, and then you assure widespread adoption and adaptation as needed. So these are the four steps of, of the public health approach to violence prevention. This is not rocket science, as you can see. And the more center that I direct is involved in steps at, at pretty much every level of this, but particularly the first three levels. And so I'm just going to take you through some of the prevention uh, projects that we're doing and some other related work around how we communicate about child sexual abuse as a public health, uh, as a preventable public health problem and not solely as a criminal justice problem and how we, how we get our federal government to um, invest in prevention as it already invests in punishment. Um, some of you may be familiar with this, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Violence Against Children surveys, or VACs. These are surveys that they implement in um, uh, many other countries. They've, they've implemented, they've conducted 24 or more um, violence against children's surveys in, in 24 or more countries. They've got five or six underway, right, as we, as we are talking. And these surveys establish the prevalence of child sexual abuse victimization and the prevalence of other types of victimization, including physical abuse and neglect. Um, so we know that in some countries, for example, 25% um, of girls and 25% of boys experience some form of child sexual abuse. We know that in other countries, the rates are higher for girls than for boys. We know that in some countries, the rates are very low for boys and girls. Um, what these international surveys show us is that child sexual abuse is influenced not only by individual level factors, but they must, these rates must also be influenced by societal level factors, because otherwise you would not get massive discrepancies in the prevalence of child sexual abuse between countries. So there must be something going on. We don't know what that is yet, but there must be something going on that might facilitate abuse in one country or um, prohibit it in another. I'll give you one example of a, of a theory I have that is completely not tested. This is just a guess on my part. But my guess is that in countries where children routinely are sent away to boarding schools, we know that boarding schools and any other kind of congregate care facility, any kind of facility where children are grouped together under the supervision of a smaller number of adults who they are not related to. So congregate care is prison, it's foster, it can be foster care if it's in like an orphanage type setting, um, reform schools, anything like that, or boarding schools, that that increases the risk to children for physical and sexual abuse. So one question I have is whether that, that might be one of the things that contributes to very different rates of child sexual abuse, particularly for boys between different countries. So that's, we are collaborating with the CDC and with Together for Girls, which is another um, uh, foundation that works with the CDC to implement these. And what we really want to do is add more perpetration uh, types of items to get a sense of how many people are sexually have sexual interest in children and also how many people have engaged in sexual behavior with children. So we have national, nationally and internationally pretty good estimates of how many children are exposed to sexual abuse. Worldwide, it's about 12% of children, which amounts to about 260 million children, will experience some form of child sexual abuse. Obviously, not all of that will be rape or other forms of uh, penetrative abuse. Um, but that's still, you know, that's that's a lot of kids that are getting exposed. We have almost no idea about how many people have sexual interest in children. So what's the prevalence of that? And we have almost no idea of how many people actually engage in sex with younger children. So we don't know, we don't have good perpetration prevalence estimates. And we need those. We need to know what those prevalence estimates are and what are the risk and protective factors that influence them. So that's one area of research that we are newly engaged in with the CDC and some other partners. We have, for the last few years, been working on a school-based uh, prevention program called Responsible Behavior with Younger Children. And this is what's called a universal prevention program. What, what that means, what a universal prevention program means is it targets an entire population. 
it's actually not based on a specific risk factor. In this case, we're targeting sixth and seventh grade children because we, are, we know that those are, those are the ages for which kids are at highest risk for engaging younger children in inappropriate, illegal, or harmful sexual behavior. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, and as you saw in that one table from Mark Chaffin's work, kids engage in these behaviors for a lot of reasons, but the single most common reason is they actually don't know that they shouldn't. Um, we are very good at conveying to older children not to hit or punch or tease or kick younger kids. Everyone on this call has probably said something like this to an older child, don't hit your younger brother. My two boys are five years apart. I say something like this every day of my life, don't hit your younger brother. Why not? You're bigger. But he started it. Doesn't matter, you're bigger. We all do that. We're all really good at doing that. Almost nobody tells that same older kid, don't touch the penis or vagina of that same younger kid. We think that kids just somehow intuitively know as they are beginning to become sexual, as they're beginning to grapple with these complicated concepts and behaviors, we think they just know better than to involve their younger friends and family members in sex, and they absolutely do not. So responsible behavior with younger children is designed to give them and their parents and educators very clear messaging around what are the developmental differences between children who are older versus younger, what are the, um, how are we supposed to behave with younger children, younger children, what is child sexual abuse, what are the um, contexts in which teens are most likely to engage in inappropriate behaviors, how to avoid those, and what to do instead. So we've taken responsible behavior with younger children through several phases. In phase one, we got focus group feedback from educators, from parents of middle school kids, and from middle school kids. We did something called rapid prototyping, which is just a kind of a fancy way of saying we got feedback on what works and what needs work on discrete parts of our, our intervention. And then we completed a small randomized um, controlled trial where the sixth and seventh graders of two schools got the intervention. The sixth and seventh graders of two other schools did not get the intervention. And we got before and after um, data on them. And then we did give the intervention to the two waitlist schools and we got after, before and after data on them again. And the results are very promising. Um, uh, I think I don't have the results up here because when I gave these slides to the military, we hadn't finished the, the randomized controlled trial yet, but I'll just tell you briefly that uh, compared to kids that didn't yet get the intervention, kids who did demonstrated more accurate knowledge about what is child sexual abuse, um, more accurate knowledge about developmental differences between kids their age and younger kids, and higher self-efficacy around avoiding inappropriate sexual behaviors with younger kids and avoiding sexually harassing behaviors with their peers. Um, so these are preliminary results. We have not yet done uh, some more formal between group analyses, but this is very promising. And so the next step for responsible behavior with younger children is a much larger randomized controlled trial where we work with um, many, many more schools, get a larger sample size and really can take a a look at what uh, what about this intervention seems to work and does it actually change behavior. Um, so we're going to be applying uh, both to the CDC and to the National Institute of Health um, for funding for a larger trial. So this is not ready for prime time. And I'm going to skip through some of these slides that just talk, well, I'll, I'll put this up, the core concepts of responsible behavior with younger children. Again, what are the developmental differences? How do we take the perspective of younger kids and treat them with empathy, care, and concern? Um, and then uh, so we use very, very clear language about why we do not engage younger children in sexual behavior. Um, so I'm gonna skip through these next slides um, so that I can get to a couple of other uh, interventions that we're working on. So help wanted, or sorry, uh, responsible behavior with younger children I mentioned is a universal prevention intervention that just targets kids based on their age and not based on any other risk factor. There are, however, some groups that I would, I think we ought to be targeting with prevention efforts. And one of those groups are people with sexual interest in children. So you would think that if you wanted to prevent child sexual abuse, the single most important group to target with prevention efforts would be people who acknowledge having sexual interest in children. Um, we do not have a good sense of how many people there are who have sexual interests in younger children. Michael Cito, another friend and colleague who's done more work in this area than anyone else, estimates that it's somewhere between 
maybe 3%, maybe up to 5% of all adult males have some sexual interest in children. Far fewer will have acted on that interest. Um, we have no prevention efforts targeting this group. Again, I think because we have tended to allow ourselves to believe that this is a group of people that can't be helped, that they're all destined to offend and they're just sort of sitting around as ticking time bombs. Again, absolutely not true. I've spoken with dozens of, of people, uh, maybe hundreds at this point, of people who have sexual interest in children know that it would be harmful to, um, to act on that sexual interest and want help either to avoid acting on it or just to achieve health and happiness while having this very, very, very stigmatized sexual interest. So we developed Help Wanted with some funding uh, from Reliance and also from the Hand Foundation and mostly just from my center. These are all of my colleagues, Ryan Shields and Amanda Rizica, really taking the lead on this intervention. And we first ran a qualitative study where we interviewed 30 young adults who were living in their communities who self-identified as having strong sexual interest in young children, prepubescent children, but who had not acted on that. And we asked them, what would have helped them when they were teenagers? Uh, what, what would have made uh, their lives a little bit easier as teenagers? And from those interviews and from our own expertise, we built out the first five sessions or modules for our help wanted prevention intervention. And these modules address, you know, what is child sexual abuse and why is it harmful? How do you cope with arousal both immediately um, and in the longer term? How do you build a healthy sexuality in which you in no way, shape or form uh, uh, engage with children either in person or online or, or through images in a sexual way? Whether and when to disclose the attraction to friends or family members or professionals and um, strategies for addressing the stigma and self-shame that, that many people with this attraction experience. So um, we are currently creating content for the family, family and friends of people with sexual interest in children who, as you might imagine, do not know what to do when their child or their friend discloses to them that they have this attraction. And we're also developing some content for professionals because even trained therapists often don't know what to do when a young person um, walks into their office and says, I have this attraction and I want help. So we're working on building out those analyses or those, uh, that content right now. Um, I wanna just play a very brief video. Again, I, I mentioned that people have a hard time envisioning what does prevention look like? This is just the landing page of our Help Wanted Prevention Intervention. We have not yet evaluated this intervention, and we have to before we're going to release it to the to the world. We are we think we're on the cusp, although we always think we're on the cusp of getting some funding to evaluate it. But I think we really might be on the cusp of getting some funding to evaluate Help Wanted, so that you so you can't find this landing page or the intervention out there yet. But I do want to take you through just this sixty second. Um, introduction that is what you would see uh, or what you will see when it's finally released. So I'm going to play that now. Uh, hmm, the, oh, darn it. Um, where did the, there we go. Okay. Welcome to Help Wanted, a course to support youth and adolescents who are sexually attracted to children and want to live a safe, healthy, non-offending life. I'm Dr. Ryan Shields from the Moore Center for the Prevention of Child Sexual Abuse at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Almost daily, we hear from adolescents and young adults looking for help, dealing with the isolation, stigma, and other challenges associated with their unwanted attraction to younger children. We developed this course to let you know that you're not alone. There are others with an attraction to children who are successfully leading happy, healthy, non-offending lives. The course content covers topics such as what child sexual abuse is and the effects and consequences for victims and people who commit abuse. We'll also offer coping strategies you can use to manage your sexual attraction to children. And we'll talk about the importance of building a positive self-image and a healthy sexuality. You can complete the Help Wanted course sessions in any order, and you can return to them as often as you like. In them, you'll find video testimonials, interactive exercises, and information to help you manage your attraction to children, navigate the issues you might face because of your attraction, and build your strengths to live a better life. Throughout the course, you'll see this icon, which means there are recommended websites, articles, and other information on the resources page to help you learn more about the topics in the course. We believe in you, and we sincerely hope you'll find this course helpful. 
So again, that's just to make the Help Wanted seem a little more real. It's Help Wanted has garnered a lot of media attention. It's, it's mentioned in a This American Life podcast that was beautifully done, a long form article on Medium. And then I have a TED Med talk um, that I gave in a, actually, I think I gave it in 2016, um, that's out there on YouTube uh, where we talk about this work. Um, I just briefly want to mention some of the areas where we're doing some work. We are collaborating with youth serving organizations, including the Y, 4-H, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Club, with the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, and with the Roman Catholic Church to try to figure out um, not only what is being done, which is a lot to prevent child sexual abuse, but how those how those efforts align with recommendations. And where can we, how can we move forward in a way that's, that's even more effective? Right now, I will tell you that these organizations, particularly Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Boys and Girls Clubs and the Y, engage in um, literally more than a thousand different specific things to address child sexual abuse. And that's a lot. And we feel like there's got to be a, a more streamlined approach to take, to keep adults um, and older older teenagers or older kids from engaging in a sexually harmful behavior with younger children. So we are delighted to be working with these partners, you know, who have a very vested interest in keeping children safe and whose mission is to include keeping children safe. Um, as I mentioned, we have a, we have a large NIH grant um, to, to really change how people think and talk about child sexual abuse from primarily a criminal justice problem that's inevitable to a preventable public health problem. And for this particular study, we are again partnering with some wonderful organizations, including the National Children's Alliance, Prevent Child Abuse America, APSAC, ATSA, and then a couple of um, more local more, more local collaborators. Um, and finally, I'll just mention that we now um, subcontract with lobbyists uh, with the specific intention of getting Congress to support child sexual abuse prevention research. We asked, along with 24 other organizations that we organized, Congress to put two, $10 million into new funding to the CDC that would support child sexual abuse prevention and research. $10 million is less than 100th of a percent of what we put into incarceration. We asked for 10 million. The House put $2 million into its budget. The Senate didn't put any money in, but did put language in supporting this effort so we are hopeful that if the House and Senate do come together to create a fiscal year 2020 uh, budget, that there will be some new dollars that are specific to child sexual abuse prevention science, to developing the science. Um, and I'll just end with a picture of my own two boys taken several years ago um, and mention that, you know, all children are our children, the Bobbies, as well as our own kids. And we need to be, um, I think, uh, uh, loving to all of them, e even the children that um, that engaged in harmful behavior um, along the way. So I am going to uh, leave it at that, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Letourneau. That what an excellent presentation. Um, as we begin to wrap things up, housekeep a couple of housekeeping items. Um, Dr. Letourneau, we had a couple of great questions come in, um, a lot asking for a little bit more information about the research that you've done. Um, if you could possibly turn your attention to the chat pod and see about maybe elaborating a little bit more on that for Alan specifically, um, we've had some great questions come in. And I'll move on to um, covering a couple of housekeeping items, if that's okay. So um, again, we would like to thank Dr. Letourneau for her time and that great presentation. Um, if you are on social media, we actually encourage you to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, where we post daily resources and details about our programming, um, so you can stay connected with us. So definitely please follow us on social media if you would like those updates and more daily resources. We are providing CE credit for social workers, licensed professional counselors, and licensed MFT for today's webinar through the University of Texas at Austin Steve Hicks School of Social Work, as well as credit for case managers through the Commission for Case Manager Certification. Certificates of completion will actually also be available for those wishing to track their training. For those wanting to receive this credit, you will need to visit the webinar event page. Um, a link to that is located right now in the chat pod at this time. Each participant seeking um, to 
a certificate will need to take an evaluation and those wanting CE credit will then need to go on to take a post test. Um, when you visit the page, you will see a purple link like the one pictured on the screen right now. And you can click on that and it will direct you to the evaluation and then to the post test. Once you take that post test and have completed the evaluation um, and you have a score of 80% or higher on the post test, certificates will be emailed to you within 24 to 48 hours. Um, some email providers direct those certificates directly to your spam folder. So please make sure to look there first. But if you still have not received your certificate once you've completed that post test, um, um, and that evaluation, please give us an email at mflnfamilydevelopment at gmail.com. And that is provided in the link, I mean, in the chat part at this time as well. Um, this webinar is actually part of our Greater Sexual Behavior in Children and Youth series. CE credits are still available for all programming in the series, and you can find more information on trainings on this topic um, on our series homepage, which you can visit. Um, to get updates on that. As we begin announcing and continuing um, our programming into 2020, we welcome you to join our FD mailing list to stay up to date on all upcoming programming, including more sexualized behavior series programming coming next year. Also, if you enjoyed our webinar today, then please be sure to check out um, MFLN's other concentration areas programming. That is available on our website um, and please feel free to explore that. Again, thank you so much for joining us today and for the great presentation, Dr. Uh, Letourneau. We hope to see you all um, in future webinars and to close things out officially, I'm going to turn things back over to Coral. Kaylin, thank you so much. I just wanted to echo Kaylin's thanks to Dr. Letourneau for her time and expertise on this uh, incredible subject. Um, we thank you all once again for joining us. We'll be keeping this room open for just a couple more minutes should you wish to collect any final links or information from the chat pod. However, do be reminded that this link right here, militaryfamilieslearningnetwork.org, uh, is our one-stop shop for today's session and includes links to the slides, to all the resources that were mentioned throughout today's session, links to uh, continuing education certificate information, and we'll also be posting the recording for your review or if you wish to share this with any colleagues or partners that may find this of use. Thanks again for tuning in. We hope to see you again soon. And Dr. Letourneau, thank you so much. Into the My family pleasure. <laughs> Into the, it was a pleasure having you. And also to the family development team for helping produce today's webinar. <laughs>